So remember that for finite automata, we have seen regular languages, right? So regular languages are languages that are accepted by finite automata. Similarly, for pushdown automata, we have seen context free languages. Now, for Turing machines, what is the language corresponding to it, right? So is there some, is, is there a language or languages that correspond to a Turing machine? That's the question we are asking here, right? For finite automata, we have regular languages. For PDA, we have context free languages. What about Turing machines? So there is a whole class of languages called as Turing machine recognizable languages. Right? So these are languages which can be recognized by or which are accepted by a Turing machine. Right? Again, unlike your finite automata and PDA, there are two classes of Turing recognizable languages. Right? So the first language is called as a recursive language. The first language is called as a recursive language. So you may also encounter this term recursive sets. A recursive set is nothing but a recursive language because the language itself is a set of words. So many times you might encounter these terms like recursive language or recursive sets. Similarly, instead of regular languages, you might also encounter this term regular sets a reg because at the end of the day, a language is a set of words. That's why in some textbooks and articles, you might encounter the word set instead of a language, but they mean the same thing in this context, right? So similarly, there is one more language called as recursively enumerable language. So if you recall recursively enumerable language, right? So if you recall, we, we, we looked at what recursively enumerable language is when we learned about the Chomsky hierarchy. We encountered this term when we learned about Chomsky hierarchy of languages and grammars, right? So if you recall unrestricted grammar, if you recall, we talked about unrestricted grammars, right? What is an unrestricted grammar? You could have anything deriving anything, right? So this is what an unrestricted grammar is. When we learned about Chomsky hierarchy, we said the, the topmost thing in Chomsky hierarchy is called the unrestricted grammar where there are no restrictions and this unrestricted grammar generates recursively enumerable languages. We use this term then, right? So now Turing machine is the most powerful automata amongst all these automata which can generate two types of languages or which can recognize two, gen two types of languages. Again, grammars generate languages, machines accept or recognize languages, right? So we'll use the term REC for this, for short form, right? Because both of them are confusing terms here. We will use recursively enumerable language. We'll use REL whenever we have to refer to recursively enumerable language. We'll use the term REC when we have to use the term recursive language. Again, you might wonder why is this term recursive here? Has it got something to do with recursion? Not exactly. Actually, these terms recursive language and recursively enumerable language were in mathematical usage even before Turing machines were, were, were discovered, right? Even before the mathematical formulation of a Turing machine pre 1930s, these terms of recursive languages and recursively enumerable languages existed. Right. So these languages were not something that were named because of recursion in programming or recursion related to Turing machines and computation. Their names have a long history, which is beyond the scope of this course. Right. But they have got, they've got nothing to do with recursion per se. Right. So we'll use the term REC to refer to recursive languages, REL to refer to recursively enumerable languages. Now we'll study both these languages in some detail in this course. So. Given a Turing machine, what I have is Turing machine recognizable languages, right? Turing machine recognizable languages. And there are two types of TM recognizable languages. There is recursive languages and recursively enumerable languages, right? And they're generated by your unrestricted grammars in the Chomsky hierarchy. So now let's go and understand what is a recursive language and how does it differ from a recursively enumerable language? So a recursive language basically works like this. Imagine if I'm given a Turing machine, imagine if I'm given a Turing machine M. Okay. So let's call it TM itself just for simplicity. Suppose if there is a word that belongs to this language. So let's assume I have a language L, right? So for all words that belong to L, right? If I take any word that belongs to this language L, then if, if for all words, TM accepts, TM accepts W, right? Which means you start from the starting state of the Turing machine, you follow through all the transitions, you will reach a final state. What does this imply? This implies Turing machine reaches a final state. 
reaches a final state and halts right final state and halts right so this is this is what happens if you give a word that belongs to the language next if you give a word that doesn't belong to the language that doesn't belong to the language then tm reaches a non final state reaches a non final state reaches a non final state and halts remember halting is a very important thing and halts so the moment a tm reaches a non final state and also halts then what do we say we reject the word so what does this imply this implies that we reject we reject or the or the turing machine rejects w so this is clear right so it, remember in both these cases the turing machine halts this is very important so whether the word belongs to the language or the word doesn't belong to the language in both instances the turing machine halts very very important right so now let's let's look at recursively enumerable languages and see how they differ from recursive languages so that you understand why i'm focusing on halting so much here right so let's go to that so let's assume i have a recursively enumerable language l and a turing machine right so in this case what happens is let's say you my word belongs to the language right then if the word belongs to the language then the turing machine the turing machine reaches a final state on reading w look at this what is happening here the tm accepts w here right in this case the turing machine reaches reaches a final state and halts reaches a final state and halts which is good right and halts very good now here comes a second case right this is good what does it mean reaches a final state and halts which means it accept which means it accepts right very simple now the second case is the tricky one now imagine if the word doesn't belong to the language then then the turing machine can do two things the turing machine can do two things right it reaches a non final state it reaches a non final state and halts a non final state and halts in this case in this case we reject in this case we anyway reject right or in other words this word is not accepted by the machine or this is very important or the turing machine goes into an infinite loop both of these things are possible look at this in in here if a word belongs to my language l the turing machine accepts it which basically means it goes to a final state and halts in this case if the, if the word doesn't belong to the language the turing machine reaches a non final state and halts basically rejecting that word in both these cases the turing machine halts in both these cases the turing machine is guaranteed to halt whether you give a word that belongs to the language or that, that, that doesn't belong to the language while in this case if the word belongs to the language the turing machine halts if the word doesn't belong to the language we can't say it can either reach a non final state and halt that's one possibility or it could get into an infinite loop right so if you think about it if you think about it if i have a question like this i'll give you a word and i ask is this word belonging to this language so my question is does does w belong to language right this is called as a membership question right or the membership property membership this is called the membership property or the membership question right so this is called the membership question or the membership property we have discussed about this uh, in one of the previous chapters also right so the question that i am asking here is does your does a given word belong to this language in the case of a recursive language if l is a recursive language look at this if l is if l is a recursive language then then i can definitely answer this question i'll just pass it to the turing machine which accepts my recursive language right i'll design the turing machine accordingly then i'll simply if if i'll simply pass this word one of the two possibilities will happen the word either belongs to the language or doesn't belong to the language so when i pass this word through the turing machine the turing machine if it reaches final state and halts i'll clearly say that this word belongs to the language if the turing machine halts and reaches a non final state i can definitely say that the, it doesn't belong right then we are we can be sure then we can decide then we can decide on the on the membership question on the membership property right on the membership property because here remember the machine is halting once the machine halts 
I can check whether we reached a non-final state or a final state. And based on that, I can answer this question definitely. Or in other words, I can decide this property. Look at this. This is where decidability also plays a role. I can decide on this property, right? But imagine if L is, okay, again, the same question, right? Does a word belong to a language, right? So very, very this is your membership property or membership question. Now, if L is recursively enumerable language, then look at this. I pass this word. I pass this word to. I pass this word through the Turing machine. The Turing machine does one of these three things. Okay, it can do one of these three things. The Turing machine can final state and halt. Final plus halt. This is cool. Then we'll just say reply saying that the word is accepted by the language. Or it could go to a non-final and halt. There are three possibilities. Non-final plus halt. Then we say reject. Very simple. Or it could get into an infinite loop. In the instances where it gets into an infinite loop, we can't answer this question definitely. Right? If L is a recursively enumerable language, then, then we cannot be sure we cannot definitely decide we cannot definitely decide or definitively decide not definitely definitively we cannot definitively decide if if w belongs to the language or not why is it so because see when if if the given w again we should be able to answer this question for any w that's what is a membership property right Given any W, can I decide whether the word belongs to the language? Right? If if the language itself is recursively enumerable language, then for some words, we will reach a final state and halt. For those words, I can decide. In some instances, I'll reach a non-final state and halt. For those words also, I can decide. But there will still be some words for which I'll get into an infinite loop where I can't say. Look at this. When I get into an infinite loop, right? I can't say exactly whether this word belongs to the language or not. So, in other words, the membership property, the membership property is undecidable. The membership property is undecidable for recursively enumerable languages, for recursively enumerable languages, while the membership property is decidable, is decidable for recursive languages. Very, very important aspect of or very, very important distinction of recursive languages and recursively enumerable languages right so th this is this is at the heart of the whole discussion itself now one more one more uh, one more discussion about recursive languages and in general about these turing languages or turing recognizable languages look at this so you have recursively enumer enumerable languages here remember that recursive languages are a subset of it remember that recursive languages are a subset of it because in recursive languages, you have both these cases. You don't have the infinite loop case, right? So recursive languages are a subset of recursively enumerable languages. And recursive languages themselves contain context-free languages. And context-free languages themselves contain regular languages and so on and so forth, right? We have seen this when we studied uh, the Chomsky hierarchy of grammars and languages also. At that time, we didn't talk about recursively enumerable and recursive as two different languages. But they're two distinct languages here. It's very, 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 very important topic. Now, given these two languages, look at, look at this. Given the, these two languages, can we talk about closure properties? Look at it. We have discussed about closure properties of context-free grammars. We have discussed, sorry, context-free languages, right? We have discussed about closure properties of regular languages, right? In these instances, what did we do? To, 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 to understand whether, let's say, regular languages are closed under union or not. We constructed a finite automata which accepts the union of two languages, two regular languages. Similarly, for context-free languages, we constructed PDAs that accept the union and so on and so forth. Right? Now, let's go and understand the closure properties of recursive and recursively enumerable languages. Here, things get slightly tricky because we'll have to start constructing Turing machines here. So, let, let, me, let me show you some proofs here or some arguments so that you understand how to understand about the closure properties of recursive and recursively enumerable languages. Let's start with the basic one. Again, construction of Turing machines is fairly easy. The only thing that you have to remember here is as far as Turing machines are concerned, there are always three possibilities that can happen. Final and halt, which means accept. Okay, let me write this down here, right? So this means accept. This means reject. This means don't know. I'll write it as infinite, right? So there are three possibilities for a Turing machine. Either it accepts by going to a final state and halting, 
it rejects by going to a non-final state and halting or it can get into an infinite loop. There are three possibilities for a Turing machine. And this is what makes the whole problem very, very interesting as far as uh, closure properties are concerned. I'll show you why. So let, let's first look at recursive languages, right? So let's assume I have two recursive languages, L1 and L2, right? So let's assume L1 is a language accepted by some Turing machine M1. Okay, let's assume L2 is a language accepted by a Turing machine M2. Now, now what I want to, now my question here is this, is L1 union L2 also recursive? So for L1 union L2 to be recursive, this should be language accepted by some machine and this machine, look at this, for this to be recursive, there should be only two possibilities. There should be no infinite loop. Look at this. So for this machine, right? The question here is this, does there exist a machine such that L1 union L2 is a language accepted by the machine where the machine only accepts or rejects, it doesn't go into an infinite loop, right? That, that's a property, right? The question I'm asking here is, is L1 union L2 a recursive language? If L1 union L2 is a recursive language, then if I design a Turing machine which accepts this language or if I design a Turing machine corresponding to this language, it either accepts or rejects. There is no infinite loop case. If the word belongs to this, it should accept. If the word doesn't belong to this union, it should reject. No infinite loop case. So can we now construct a Turing machine M given that, again remember, we are given that L1 is a recursive language and L2 is a recursive language, which means this machine itself, this machine itself accepts or rejects. No infinite loop. So there exists a machine. Look at this. The very fact that L1 is a recursive language means that there exists a Turing machine which upon which if I give any word that belongs to this language, it accepts. If I give any word that is not part of this language or that doesn't belong to this language, it rejects. So I have these two machines. Now I have to construct a machine M that accepts all the words that are there in L1 or L2, right? That, that's how I have to construct it. Again, this is a very, very important step in the construction, okay? First and foremost, please remember that your simple Turing machine, I'll write it as STM. Your simple Turing machine is same in computational ability as your semi-infinite, as your semi-infinite Turing machine, which has the same computational power as a multi-tape Turing machine. Look at this, we, we, have, we have talked about the equivalences of Turing machines, right? So given any simple Turing machine, I can simulate that using a semi-infinite Turing machine or I can simulate it using a multi-tape Turing machine. So I'll use this equivalence now. See, the reason I've discussed about this equivalence in one of the previous videos is because I would like to leverage it now. So imagine my machine one. Imagine there is a simple Turing machine corresponding to my machine one. Imagine that M2 is a simple Turing machine. For every simple Turing machine, I can construct an equivalent semi-infinite Turing machine. So my M1, I'll construct for M1, I'll construct a semi-infinite Turing machine, right? So let's say this is tape one of machine one, right? So this is semi-infinite. Look at this. This is semi-infinite. Similarly, let's take the tape of tape 2 of machine 2. Look at this. Because for every simple Turing machine, I can construct a semi equivalent semi-infinite Turing machine and an equivalent multi-tape Turing machine. Right? Again, this is a very, very important aspect in this proof. So, given this M1, assume that M1 is actually a simple Turing machine. I'll construct the equivalent semi-infinite Turing machine and I'll call it as M1. Right? I'll just call it as M1 instead of reusing another term here. Similarly, for M2, instead of writing the simple Turing machine equivalent of it, I'll write the semi-infinite Turing machine, which means now I have two tapes. This, this is infinite tape on one side, but the other side, it's it's not infinite. It is, it is blocked. Now, let's see. Now, look at this. Now, if you look at this, for my Turing machine 1, look at this. I have, I have a finite control corresponding to this. How would my machine 1 look like? My machine 1, will have a finite control corresponding to this. This is my finite control unit one. This is my finite control two. This is my read write head. Of course, read write head will point to, okay, let me draw this properly. Okay, so this is my finite control, which is pointing to each element here. This is my finite control two. So this is my tape T1. This is the finite control of machine one. This is a finite control of machine two. This is the tape two. In this case, I'm using this equivalence of simple Turing machine to semi-infinite Turing machine to get my two machines. Now, what do I want to construct? I want to construct a machine M. Look at this. I want to construct a machine M. And remember these machines, right? If you think about them, these machines, 
if they take a word w that belongs to l1 right so let's assume w belongs to l1 if it takes this as input w belongs to l2 there are only two possibilities of these machines these machines accept or reject there are only two possibilities now see how i'll construct my new machine i'll construct my new machine as follows first let's assume the input is on t1 look at this because because a multi tape turing machine is also equivalent to a simple turing machine so my m i'll construct it as a multi tape turing machine i can construct a multi tape turing machine right i can also construct a multi tape semi infinite turing machines also so now my machine m will have two tapes okay let me draw this separation here so that so my m is a multi tape my m is a multi tape turing machine since we know that multi tape turing machines are computationally equal to simple turing machines i can construct any of these no, nothing stops me so let's assume there is an input given here on tape so let's assume i have this input abc okay so this is my tape 1 of m1 this is my tape 2 i have two tapes now here also i'll have a finite control i'll have a finite control right but since i have two tapes i'll have two tape heads right since i have two tapes i have two tape heads and these tape heads are read write heads right so i'll now i'll define my finite control as follows okay again so look at this first abc is there so abc is here first thing that i'll do here is i'll copy this input from tape 1 to tape 2 i can write my finite control to simply copy this input here i can do that right nothing stops me so abc let's say blank 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 okay here everything is blanks right so i'll i'll write some finite automata steps here or finite transitions here which says keep traversing this input till the time you find blank and copy whatever you see here right copy whatever you see here right so first step i've copied right so first step okay let, let's write the steps also right copy from copy word from t1 to t2 cool very good now i'll define my finite control in such a way this is this is the most interesting part i'll define my finite control again what is a finite control it's nothing but a finite automata it it's very core with some transitions and with some edits and right left symbols right i'll define my finite control in such a way this is the most important that i will simulate whatever this finite control one does whatever this finite control one does whatever transitions it does i will do it on tape one whatever transitions that finite control two does i will simulate that on t2 so in other words i will simulate i will simulate uh, machine 1 i'll simulate machine 1 on tape 1 and i'll simulate and i'll simulate machine 2 on tape 2 again this finite control is going to be far more complex this finite control is going to be more complex but it will it will basically define in such a way that whatever transitions are part of fc1 will be simulated on this i can do that right i can write a complex finite control here that that simply simulates whatever it does and it also simulates everything that the finite control 2 also does on tape 2 right so i'm simulating both of them i'll parallelly simulate this is very important i will parallelly simulate both of them because i have two read write heads right i can move this read write head independent of this read write head and i can edit whatever symbols i want here independent of this which means i can parallelly simulate m1 on t1 and m2 on t2 i can do that right now once i parallelly simulate both of them now comes the most interesting aspect right now comes the most interesting aspect if m1 m1 there are two possibilities right accept or reject m2 there are two possibilities accept or reject if if either of them accepts because what do we want to see if the word belongs to either l1 or the word belongs to l2 that's what union basically means right what does it mean when i say w belongs to l1 union l2 if the machine 1 reaches the final state or the machine 2 reaches the final state right in each of these cases if either of them reaches the final state i will say accept and i'm guaranteed that both these machines will either reach uh, will either reach an accept state or a reject state there is no possibility of infinite state because remember the fundamental assumption we made was that l1 is a recursive language which means machine 1 has only two possibilities here right so i accept in every other case except if i get reject in both cases See, look at this i'm simply simulating them right so i'll also simulate the final states initial states of fc1 in this i'd also simulate and uh, simulate the initial and final states of finite control 2 in here right now if both of them reach a reject state then i'll reject 
else i will always accept if this is accept this is accept i'll accept accept reject i'll accept reject accept i'll accept because the word because what do we want we want the union right we want the union right so very simple and i'm guaranteed that this machine halts because machine 1 and machine 2 halt when i simulate them on tape 1 and tape 2 using this finite control i'm guaranteed that they halt and they'll reach one of these two states guaranteed right look look at look at how i'm arguing about the construction of the new machine okay again this is the flow of logic when you want to talk about closure properties of recursive languages right this this is this is one way of proving it or arguing about it okay again since this is the first one i've gone in some depth i'll simplify this further for you in the next few examples that i'll provide right so union of recursive languages is closed right it is closed because why is it closed because i am able to construct a turing machine m which is a multi tape turing machine that only accepts if l1 accepts or l2 accepts uh, sorry if m1 accepts or m2 accepts that i am able to construct this of course this is a multi tape turing machine but we already know that multi tape turing machines are equivalent to standard turing machines so why bother about it look, look at the flow of logic here the flow of logic is very very important here the way we are arguing about it is very very important here right so now let's go to a slightly different example imagine if i want the same thing for recursively enumerable languages what happens here again the flow stays the same as above same as above same as above but look at this look at this imagine i have a machine one that so suppose i have two languages l1 l2 right and there is a machine that accepts l1 there is a machine for l2 again remember that l1 and l2 are recursively enumerable languages right now i want l1 union l2 they are recursively enumerable what do you mean by recursively enumerable very very importantly when i say recursively enumerable this machine can get into three states accept reject or infinite loop right there are three possibilities similarly machine 2 it can get into accept reject or infinite loop so just like in the previous case right i'll have the multi tape turing machine on each tape i'll simulate on one tape i'll simulate m1 on other tape i'll simulate m2 so whatever input word is given to me i'll simulate it on one tape using m1 on the other tape using m2 okay this is how we think about it this is a much more easier way to think about it than thinking about it in terms of tapes again this diagram is very standard diagram that you will find in standard textbooks like hopcraft it's a very nice diagram to understand also so given a word what i'll do here is i'll replicate that word on this tape i'll also replicate it on this tape right and i'll simulate machine 1 and machine 2 in my machine so my machine now look at this my machine now my m will behave like this my m look at this is a block diagram of my m my m takes w it simulates two tapes one tape corresponding to m1 second tape corresponding to m2 because i can use a multi tape turing machine because it's equivalent to a single tape turing machine right so on m1 i'll simulate this on m2 uh, sorry on uh, on tape 1 i'll simulate machine 1 on tape 2 i'll simulate machine 2 using my finite control of the new machine now look at this now that the multiple possibilities again i want to argue that l1 union l2 is also a recursively enumerable language right so what does that mean if this accepts and this accepts what should i do look at this if, so suppose if this goes into an infinite loop and this goes into an infinite loop what should i do then okay if this if machine 1 goes into an infinite loop machine 2 goes into an infinite loop my machine m also goes into an infinite loop right my machine m also goes into an infinite loop so this generates so this generates an infinite loop in this case i can't do anything but if any one of if if any one of them accepts look at this if any one of them accepts any one accepts if any one of these machines accepts look at this if this accepts and this can be in any of the three states or this accepts and this can be in any of the three states if any one of them as, as, if any one of m1 or m2 accepts which means it reaches a final state and accepts then i will simply ac accept it very simple case right the, the third case if both both reject the third case is both rejecting right both reject i will reject very simple look at this now does that does that work with the with the logic of union remember that if w belongs to l1 union l2 look at this if w belongs to l1 union l2 
Remember, we want to prove that L1 union L2 is a recursively enumerable language, which means if it belongs, I should always accept. If it doesn't belong, if it doesn't belong, I can either go to reject state or I can go into an infinite loop. Right? So, what does this mean? Look at this. Let's go logically. What does this mean? This means W belongs to L1 or L2, which means W is accepted either by L1, uh, either by M1 or W is accepted by M2. So, that's, that's why I wrote this logic. If any one of them accepts it, I will accept it. Satisfying this condition. If both of them reject, look at this. If both of them reject, then I will reject. If, if both of them get into an infinite loop, look at this. If both of them get into an infinite loop, I'll get into an infinite loop. Right? Very simple. Now, there is one more case. If this goes into R and this goes into infinity, what do we do? This goes into reject and this goes into infinity. Right? So, look at this. There, there is another possibility, right? So, this rejects. Let's say machine 1 rejects. The other one goes into an infinite loop. What should I do now? All other cases are handled. Right? A with everything is handled. A with. So, if this rejects, right? Then I know. Look at this. If this rejects, I know that W doesn't belong to L1. But for me to, to be very sure that W doesn't belong to the union of both of them, it should also not belong to L2. Right? But, I, but M2 hasn't yet rejected it. So, this will also go into the infinite loop case. So, reject infinite becomes infinite. Right? Accept with any one accept. Accept with anything else. Accept with anything else becomes accept. If both reject, reject. If both infinity, infinite. Right? Very simple. Similarly, this infinite. Similarly, this infinite with this reject is also infinite. Just to be clear here. Right? If, if M1 is going into an infinite loop, and M2 is rejecting it. Even that case will go into infinite loop. So, this is how we can think about the block diagram. So, this is the block diagram of a Turing machine, especially when you want to combine multiple Turing machines. Right? So, th this is how you can think about all the cases and argue. Again, now look at this. Look at this language now. L1 union L2. If a word belongs to it, we always accept. If a word doesn't belong, if a word doesn't belong to it, we either go into an infinite loop or we reject. Thereby satisfying the requirements of a recursively enumerable language, right? So, union of recursively enumerable language is also closed, which means this is also a recursively enumerable language. Again, look at look at the flow of logic here. Here we went into the world of tapes, etc. Okay, which is which is which is a foundation. Here, instead of draw, drawing all those tapes, let's think one level above. Here, what am I saying here? Given this word, I have a tape here. Look at this. I have a tape here. I'm not just using this. There is a tape here. And this machine M has two tapes now, T1 and T2. Now, I'll simulate M1 on T1, simulate M2 on T2. I can do that, right, using the finite control of M. So, this is the block diagram which helps us immensely in arguing about closure properties and other properties of Turing machines, right. So, very, very, very interesting case here. Now, let's talk about intersection, right, very, very interesting case. So, let's talk about, let's look at intersection of both recursive languages and recursively enumerable languages. So, let, let's assume I have this, right? So, again, I'll draw the block diagram approach because this is much easier to think about it, right? Suppose if I'm given two languages, L1 and L2. L1, there is a machine M1 corresponding to it. L2, there is a machine 2 corresponding to it. Now, given a word, I'll pass it both to two tapes. I'll have two tapes, obviously, right? So, I have my machine 1 here. I have my machine 2 here. First, let's talk about recursive languages, okay? Then we'll go to recursively enumerable languages. The concepts will remain the same. So, this machine can accept or reject. Two possibilities. This will accept or reject because we are talking about recursive languages first. Right? Now, if, if both of them reject, look at this, if both of them reject, I reject. Rest everything, I accept. Right? If both of them reject, I reject. If even one accept, I accept. At least one accept. At least one accept. Sorry, both accept. I'm sorry. My bad. My bad. The other way. This is intersection, right? I got confused. My bad. So, look at this. What, what is the logic behind intersection? I got confused. If a language belongs to both L1 and L2, which means machine 1 should accept it and machine 2 also should accept it. Only in this case, I will accept. In all other cases, all other cases, all other cases, I will simply reject. Because, look at this. If M1 rejects, and M2 accepts. What happens then? Let's ask that question. So, M1 rejects 
and M2 accept. So what does this imply? This implies that your word, your given word. Again, here also I am simulating the tapes, everything. I have a tape here, I have a tape here. My whole machine M is a multi-tape Turing machine. The same logic flows, right? So M1 rejects. M1 rejects the word W. So W, W I sent it. W I sent it, rejected it, accepted. What does this mean? This means W doesn't belong to L1. So what does this imply? W belongs to L2. Look at this. For intersection, W should belong to both L1 and L2. But here it's not belonging to L1. That's why I'm rejecting it. Very simple. So recursive languages are also closed under intersection. Closed under intersection. Very simple logic here. Once you get the hang of this, again, in all of these arguments, the most important thing is to think in terms of the semi-infinite tapes, right? Again, being able to simulate machines on individual tapes and the equivalence of multi-tape Turing machine to single tape Turing machine. All of those concepts are the most important ones here, right? So now, now for intersection of recursive languages, we are done. What about, what if these languages are recursively enumerable languages? Okay, then these machines also will have the infinite loop case. Let, let's write this down, right? So what, what if, what if, what if we get into that, right? So for recursively enumerable languages, okay, for recursively enumerable languages, sorry. For recursively enumerable languages, what happens? There are three possibilities. Only in the case that both of them accept, I will accept. Look at this. Only in the case that both of them accept, I'll accept, right? If, if both of them reject, right? Or if one of them rejects, look at this, if any one of them rejects, okay, any one rejects, okay, let's write this case, any one rejects, any one rejects, I will simply reject both infinite loop, that's the other possibility, right? Both infinite loop, I'll just go into an infinite loop, right? Look at this, even if one of these, one of, even if the word doesn't belong to one of the languages, we'll have to reject it, right? So I can also construct it for the case of recursively enumerable languages, right? Let's assume L1, L2 are recursively enumerable languages. Let's assume, right? Which means the machines will have three possible outcomes. Infinite loop, accept, reject. M2 also will have infinite loop, accept, reject, right? When should I accept this word? If both these machines accept, that's why I have this. If this accepts and this accepts, I'll accept, right? If any one of them rejects, See, this could be an infinite loop, but this might reject. If any one of them rejects, I know, suppose, let's, let's assume M2 rejects it, which means W doesn't belong to L2, which means obviously it doesn't, L2 doesn't belong to the intersection of both of them. If any one of them rejects, I'll simply say reject. If both of them get stuck in an infinite loop, I'll just say infinite loop. Look at this, L1, L2 are recursively enumerable languages. Then I can construct a machine M that will also, that will also be able to process my L1 intersection L2. Again, this will also be a recursively enumerable language because there are three outcomes here, right? Whenever the word belongs to this intersection, I'll always accept. Whenever the word doesn't belong, I either reject or I get into an infinite loop. That's what we want. So recursively enumerable languages are also closed under intersection. They are also closed under intersection, right? I, I hope you're getting a pulse or a, or a good idea of how we are going through these Turing machine logics. Again, Turing machine logics are easier than your PDP logics, right? Uh, than your PDA logics, right? So, because it's much more easy as far as as far as closure properties are concerned, it's much more easy to construct Turing machines because Turing machines there are a lot of these equivalences, like semi-infinite tape or a multi-tape. All of them are equivalent, and I can simulate a, I can I can just copy whatever I want. I can I can simulate a machine on one tape while simulating other machine on other tape. I can do all of them, thereby constructing these types of proofs of closures on recursively enumerable and recursive languages is much easier, right? So now, now let's get into this.